So one of the first instances that I remember when I was working with Emmaus Ministries was we were walking down the street and there was a young man who Randy, the staff person, knew from other previous times and this young man was just very depressed and was having a really hard time and he was hungry and he just really wanted somebody to talk to, he needed to sit down. And Randy says, let's go over and have a burrito over here. And we went over and sat down and this, this young man just talked and talked and talked and Randy and he talked, I basically just sat there and listened. Um, I was only maybe, had only done it like three or four times. So to me though, it was the first time I became aware of that sense of homelessness being not an issue, but a state of being for an actual human being, for an actual person just like me. Like I could be that guy sitting there eating the burrito if the circumstances were the right thing. And it, it, I think it was what impacted me the most. Um, so out of that scene, I, I wrote this chapter, which introduces, uh, to give you a little background about this, Joe um, Sullivan is the main character, and her friend Keisha and her are on their way to dinner in Chicago um, on the north side, and um, Joe is upset in this scene about a letter she received from her family, and she doesn't communicate with her family at all. That's kind of a subplot going throughout it. She has issues with her family, and that, that actually helps her feel closer to the kids because in a lot of instances, the kids are on the street because either they were thrown out or they had to leave or felt they had to leave because of some danger or, or something wrong in their own homes. So here is the scene. The scene. Everyone has a dark, gaping hole somewhere in their life. Some manage to live with only a toe or two slipping into the depths for a while. Others dwell there, buried deep, embraced by the darkness. Ever since adolescence, Jo felt like she'd been balancing on the lip of that black hole. She stared at the unopened letter in her hand and felt the past trying to pull her into the darkness. Were they stupid or just sadistic? She'd changed her frickin' phone number, hadn't talked to them in two years. Why couldn't they leave her alone? The wall clock clicked off the seconds, so loud, too loud. I don't know why you didn't make an earlier reservation. Keisha sat on Joe's kitchen counter, eating M&Ms straight from the bag. Gold hoops dangled against the flawless bronze skin of her neck when she shook her head. It's a myth, woman, you know, that models don't eat. If I don't get me some grilled portobello, hey! She jumped to the floor and fished out the envelope Joe had just dropped in the trash. That's not junk mail, Jojo. It's, oh. She looked up from the postmark to study Joe's face. It's from your family. Joe grabbed the letter and crumpled it into a ball. Shoving it down the garbage disposal, she turned on the water and flipped the switch. The motor grated and groaned, kicking back a smell like sour milk. Lemons. She needed lemons to grind through the blades to sweeten the slimy pipes. And tequila. Lots and lots of tequila. <laughs> Don't look at me that way. Joe faced the wall, Keisha behind her, but she knew that look. Poor girl. Poor fucked up girl. Her father raped a little boy, killed him maybe, and never went to jail. Poor Joe. I can look any way I want, Joe turned in time to see the down dip of Keisha's shrug, but I'm saying nothing. We've been, here, been there and said that before. You'll see. Someday you'll see I'm right, and I'm praying it ain't too late when you do. Keisha had been Joe's one constant through three jobs, four men, and a divorce. The only one who knew what she was running from. Sometimes Joe regretted the moment when Cuervo Gold and lack of sleep let some of her garbage flow through the dam she'd locked up tight. It wouldn't happen again. The waters flowed free and clear now. There was no before, only an after. She would see to that, goddammit, if she had to shred every scrap of paper between here and Davenport. Another time, she said, meaning never. This is a celebration, remember? New job for me and new layout gig for you. We are on top of the world and deserve a taste of the finest cuisine italiano this city has to offer. Joe grabbed her purse off the counter, ignoring Keisha's friendly jibe about mixing French nouns with Italian adjectives. On top of the world, yeah, right. Except some days the world resembled a deep pile of shit, so where did that leave them? She shook her head and pulled on her coat. They were going to be late. A quick check, car keys, wallet, pepper spray. Let's go, 
She led the way out and locked her apartment behind her. For a moment, she rested her palm on the thick wood of the door panel, double bolted, secure, a place to call home in a neighborhood she loved, but damn, damn, why didn't they leave her alone? Did she have to freaking move before they'd get the message? She let Keisha do most of the talking as Joe drove. The night view going north along Lakeshore drove, drove, Drive always drew her eye. The dark distance across the water to her right, the city lights like stars on a geometric horizon ahead, energizing, intriguing, inviting. Finding a parking space vented the rest of Joe's anger. She could even grin as she gave a driver the finger for nosing out too far into the walkway they had to cross. He responded with a bored flip of his own. Then she noticed Keisha had stopped. She was staring at something across Broadway. What's up? Streetlights washed out the blink of green neon from the hotel chateau. Most of the windows had drapes drawn closed. Half of them hung crooked on their rods. Near the entrance stood a younger woman, hands in the pockets of a short jacket with a collar turned up. When the girl noticed them, she hurried around the corner. Lexi, Keisha called and headed after her. Joe followed. Alexis, I know it's you. Quit trying to get away. To Joe, she added, she's just a kid. When the girl turned and waited with a sullen expression, Joe saw what Keisha meant. Despite the reek of perfume, thick layers of eyeshadow, and mascara that turned her lashes into tarantula legs, she could, have, she could not have been older than 15. They stood by a playground of brightly painted equipment, swing sets, slides, and climbing bars, strong and sturdy and still unrusted. By contrast, through a window of the pockmarked hotel behind the park, faded wallpaper hung in strips. I didn't do nothing, the girl said. Look at you, Keisha waved to emphasize her point. Under Lexi's jacket, a black tube top clung to her breasts. The leather mini skirt wrapped around her hips looked so tight, Joe thought it must hurt. What? Lexi said, avoiding eye contact. I'm not doing nothing wrong, she said again. I don't like seeing you here, Lexi, Keisha said quietly. I wish you had somewhere to stay. Yeah, well, Lexi looked down. I don't. Now Joe understood. Despite Keisha's often hectic schedule, she found time to volunteer at the Night Moves Center for Homeless Youth. She identified with them because she almost ended up one of them. Raised on the South Side, struggling financially, only her mother's love and strong will had saved her. Jo studied Lexi in the dim light. She looked half child, half whore, skin the color of bittersweet chocolate, hair drawn back, finely curved cheekbones. Her jaw jutted out defiantly. A large man's hand could have wrapped around her throat with fingers nearly touching the thumb. Stop by the center tomorrow, okay? Keisha reached out and tucked a straight curl behind Lexi's ear. It's my day to work. We can talk. Yeah, sure. Lexi still studied the sidewalk. Keisha put a hand on her arm to get her to look up. I mean it, she said. I'll worry if you don't come. Keisha earned her living as a model. Most people only saw the perfect coppery complexion, the fine figure, the stylish clothes. But at that moment, Lexi looked at Keisha the way someone dying of thirst looked at a glass of water. Lunchtime tomorrow, Keisha continued. I'll be waiting. She touched the girl's arm again, and Lex Lexi nodded agreement. Good. Now take care, you hear? Joe and Keisha started to turn away. Wait. The words seemed to rush out of Lexi before she could think. They looked back. I was wondering if, you know, if you could... She looked at Joe, then quickly back at Keisha. Could you buy me something to eat, maybe? I'm awful hungry. Joe had a second to picture this half-naked child seated at a corner table set with fine linen and Waterford crystal before Keisha said, How about a burrito? Eduardo's, famous for a clam sauce made from Mediterranean shellfish and extra virgin olive oil, did not serve burritos. Felipe's, Felipe's taco and burrito place, however, did. As soon as they walked in the door of the little restaurant, they were hit by the smell of greasy meat. Keisha ordered and paid. Then they found a booth near the counter to wait for their food. You talked to your mom lately? Keisha asked the girl. Lexi shook her head, twirling the salt shaker around and around on the table. She don't want to hear from me. Things change, Lexi, Keisha said. People change. Yeah, you got that right. She starts to drink and she'd be changing all right, from one cold bitch to one screaming hot one. Joe found herself asking, what about your father, other family? What about your father, echoed in her mind, other family. She told the voice to shut the hell up. 
Well, Lexi started slowly. I do have this aunt in Rockford somewhere, and I was thinking maybe <coughs> she broke off to shake, shake her head. What good's that do me? Might as well be Africa or something. Takes money, you know? How much you spending on heroin these days, Lexi? Keisha asked quietly. The girl touched fingers to her forearm like she tested to see if the needle marks were still under her sleeve. Think that food will be coming soon? She glanced toward the counter. How long have you been on the streets? Joe asked. Where do you sleep at night? Shelters? Do you? The cashier called their number and Lexi jumped up to get her food without answering. Joe? Joe turned away from watching Lexi and frowned at Keisha's intent expression. This isn't an interview, Jojo. This is a girl's life we're talking about here, so just let me do the talking. Keisha was referring to the job Joe had just gotten three weeks ago. The Winds of Change was a small weekly paper that scraped, scraped the crud off social issues. The truth as it really was, or at least the paper's version of it. Chicago's anti-relationship with the homeless was one of those issues. And Joe had been hired in part to write a column called Street Stories. That girl could be me, Keisha continued, if I'd had a mama like hers. She from the na same neighborhood as me, same block almost. What if that was me you was talking to, Joe? Think about it. Joe bit back words as Lexi returned to the table with her food. Keisha was right, but that didn't make it any easier to sit back and become a discreet observer. Lexi cut off a great chunk of burrito and shoveled it down without waiting for it to cool. She leaned over the table and her attention fixed on her plate. A couple gul gulps of cola, another scoop of beans and rice. Thanks, she mumbled past the food in her mouth. What about that job you told me about, Keisha asked her. At the funeral home, cleaning up, you said. Lexi choked and started coughing. S food sprayed back onto her plate. Keisha pushed Lexi's soda closer, and the girl grabbed the can and drank, eyes watering. She ripped some napkins out of their holder and wiped her mouth and eyes. Hot, she said, her eyes still streaming. Keisha waited until Lexi had her coughing under control, then pushed her point. The job, Lexi, what about the job? Lexi glanced at them with darkened eyes. She picked up the burrito and began eating again. Filling spilled onto the table. There never was a job, was there, Keisha said finally. Not no cleaning, that's for sure, Lexi spit out. When I get down on my knees, I ain't going to be scrubbing no floors. Why, Lexi? Keisha leaned back in her seat. I need the money. After a second, she added, to get to my aunt's. How else am I supposed to get there? You're not volunteering, are you? Quick thinking. But even if there was an aunt in Rockford, even if Lexi did want to save money to get there, the odds were it didn't matter. The girl shot dope. Intelligent, good-looking, young, those things didn't matter either. The only way that girl was going to get to her aunt's was by way of a drug rehab program. Oh, come on, Joe, Joe could stay silent no longer. There are easier ways to earn money. Lexi leaned forward. What you know about it? You didn't get kicked out by your own mama, did you? Because her boyfriend was messing with you since she was 12. Joe's right, Lexi, Keisha said. There are other options. But her quiet voice did not condemn. But you've got to want it. Now you know that. Options. Lexi sat back and fiddled with her fork. Ain't nobody like me got options. She looked at them both, then down at her plate. What difference it make what happened to me anyway? The bitter, hard-ass teen was gone. She looked like a little girl with sad, wistful eyes. Might as well go back to that funeral home, even if I do end up like the Brit. Who? Keisha asked. Lexi shuddered. Tommy the Brit. This wino used to be on the streets. They got him there in this glass coffin. A homeless guy in a glass coffin? Joe leaned forward in her seat. If this wasn't newsworthy material, she had no right to be in the biz. Thing is, Lexi continued, last time I talked to him, he said someone was watching him. I thought no one could pay attention to a bum like him. But there he was, dead. Scared me good, you know. Lexi leaned in and lowered her voice. I keep thinking, what if he was right? She glanced over her shoulder. Just then, a man walked in, his face pale and horse-like, dull hair thinning on top, glasses perched on his nose. A well-tailored suit hung from his slight frame. Mild and unremarkable, he looked like a schoolmaster in an after-school after special. Oh, shit! Lexi ducked her head. The, when the man, did I say that right? Lexi ducked her head. When the man turned his back, she rose from the booth and hurried out into the night, leaving behind a large portion of the first real meal she'd probably had in days. <laughs>